thank our supporters, um, the, uh, the Siemens Foundation, the J.L. Betzel Foundation, uh, City of Mobile, Alabama State Council for the Arts, the NEA, our members and our board. Um, and uh, for this evening, uh, you're, as I said, you're in for a treat. We have uh, Dr. Matthew Downs. Um, he is the Dean uh, of the College of Arts and Science and Professor of History at the University of Mobile. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Alabama where he studied modern Southern history with a focus on the South in the 20th century. Um, author of Transforming the South and co-editor of The American South and the Great War. Um, he's going to talk to you this evening and I'm going to introduce Dr. Downs. Thank you for inviting me. I love talking about history. It's never a problem. I always say yes. <laughs> and I'm a really big fan of the New Deal, so this is right up my alley. I will warn you, I'm not an artist, not an art historian, but sort of a historian, so we'll see how that goes. In the depths of the Great Depression, President Franklin Roosevelt flooded the country with programs to provide relief. The alphabet agencies of his New Deal were designed to revive the economy, to instill confidence among Americans that the Depression was temporary, and that through perseverance and government assistance, Americans would return to prosperity. Historians continue to debate the success of the New Deal, but certainly the programs he created entered the popular memory of the era. The TVA's hydroelectric dams, the AAA's farm practices, the CCC's outdoor camps, but no program so shaped the visual memory of the New Deal and the Depression as the Works Progress Administration, or the WPA, and its federal art project. The FAP put artists to work. And in the process, it democratized art. It kept creative professionals active and engaged, and it lived to the spirits of a depressed population. The New Deal may not have ended the Depression, but programs like the FAP ensured that Americans held hope for a future beyond poverty, beyond unemployment. And in that, I think we can consider it a rousing success. During the election of 1932, Roosevelt made clear that unlike his opponent, the Republican incumbent Herbert Hoover, he would act assertively to address the effects of poverty on the population. The New Deal emerged from Roosevelt's progressive ideology. The idea that government had a responsibility to ensure the fair operation of the economy. And while governor of New York, Roosevelt had met the onset of the Depression with public works programs and other reforms. Roosevelt believed in the power of work. He thought that people who had jobs made money, that they then returned to the economy. He also liked the idea that unemployed people were self-reliant. They could care for themselves and their families without the need for additional assistance from private or public agencies. Thus, the rampant unemployment of the Depression, which reached 25%, and which was accompanied by partial employment that left the majority of Americans making less than enough to survive, that was the core problem. If the government could spark employment, it would put money in pockets that would then be spent in the economy, and that money would then lift the nation out of hard times. And so a lot of Roosevelt's programs were make-work programs focused on labor, physical outdoor labor. Most of us think of the Civilian Con Conservation Corps and young men who were paid to work in parks, state and national parks. But there are other programs that you probably know, the Civil Works Administration, the Public Works Administration, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, like administrations, they all work the same way. Economic relief based in work that could be done by those individuals, mostly young men, although some young women too, who were either unskilled or weren't skilled in the jobs that the government was providing for them, and who wanted a job and needed the money. The Works Progress Administration was created in 1935, and it operated in that same vein. It would eventually put 8.5 million people to work building roads, bridges, parks, buildings, at a cost to the government of nearly $11 million. But unlike its fellow alphabet agencies, the WPA also targeted a group of workers that we wouldn't necessarily call unskilled. They were creative professionals. They were artists, actors and directors, musicians, writers. Through these WPA programs, sometimes called Federal Project Number One or Federal One, 
the New Deal created work that reshaped culture. So Roosevelt was no stranger to public arts programs. While governor, he had approved programs in New York in which the government paid people to paint murals and teach in community centers. But the larger nationwide programs that came with the New Deal seem to have been sparked by the lobbying of a painter named George Biddle. Biddle worried about the state of art in the United States. He thought the average American had little interest in artwork, they didn't go to museums, they weren't going to exhibitions, they weren't buying art at art sales. And with the onset of the Depression, Biddle was worried that that would get worse. Art seemed too attached to affluent elites who were frankly not the most popular people during the Depression. Biddle also admired the work of Mexican muralists like Diego Rivera. Here were artists funded by the state whose work carried a social message that spoke to the average person. And because FDR had this history of public art, it suggested that maybe now as president, Roosevelt might listen. So Biddle went out, he got tentative commitments from a number of well-known artists and murals, Thomas Hart Benton, Edward Lanning, and he pitched his idea to the White House, and Roosevelt embraced it. He thought of it as a way to prime the economic pump by putting artists to work, but it would also allow him to create a kind of publicity for the New Deal that would allow him to portray the ideals he wanted stressed in American society, and it might even, Roosevelt thought, inspire confidence in other New Deal programs. Now, for the most part, we associate Bill's dream with the WPA and the Federal Art Project. But the first incarnation of it actually came from the Treasury Department. Oops, I'm the wrong way. There it is. The Treasury Department with a program in which artists were used to decorate public buildings, a program called the Section of Fine Arts, or usually just the Section. It was headed by Edward Bruce. Bruce was a lawyer who at one point had owned a newspaper in the Philippines. He was also a monetary expert with a focus on silver, and an avid painter who, at the onset of the New Deal, was employed in Treasury to focus on international monetary matters. Bruce picked up those visions stating that, given Treasury's oversight of public buildings, the department could utilize federal relief money to employ artists to, quote, eliminate ugliness in the world. <laughs> Under his leadership, Section appointed a series of local committees across the country. These committees were made up of museum directors, art society members, maybe some of you would have been on one. And at these, these committees acted as juries who would judge submissions by artists hoping to work on public projects. If chosen, the artists received a government, a government wage and were tasked with producing a piece of art for public consumption. This could include anything from paintings and ceramics to posters, stage sets, lighting fixtures, maps, textiles. Ideally, the items produced would find a home in some public space, a federal building, a local school, a municipal community center, there were even section works in army barracks and on naval ships. Of course, given the spirit of, of Biddle's recommendations and the nature of the art needed for public buildings, the most iconic works of section artists were murals. So here's how the process worked. Bruce's agency would announce a commission. Artists would submit a very small, a kind of three by one foot sketch of their proposed mural with no identifying marks. The jury would then make a selection, but Section and Bruce always had final say. They wanted to make sure the art was of good quality and that it would be acceptable to the community. The artists selected had to put up a bond to secure the work, and they had to furnish their own materials. And then they got paid, once at the beginning, once about halfway through, and once when it was over. Of course, that approval process meant that Bruce and Section had a very outsized say in the nature of the work made for Section. Bruce felt art should be simple, it should be straightforward, inspiring, not challenging. As Bruce said, quote, the artist business is to help people to see and enjoy seeing and not think. <laughs> As you can probably guess, some artists choose to have such control. Bruce hoped that established artists would just jump at the chance to make public art, but when he approached Thomas Hart Benton to submit sketches for murals designed to go in the post office, Benton refused to work under supervision. Even George Bill couldn't escape scrutiny. When the mastermind behind such federal art programs won a commission for the Justice Department, 
He had to fight Bruce in order to keep his own style in the face of criticism that his subjects were too dour. Other artists were censored. The best example, I think, of political oversight came when the muralist Rockwell Kent was commissioned to paint a series of scenes for the post office. One scene showed Inuit peoples sending a letter to Puerto Rico. And you can imagine, right, we're from Alaska all the way to Puerto Rico, we're showing the broad reach of the mail. When Kent finished the work, inspectors noticed that the letter being delivered, the letter being delivered included a message that was encouraging Puerto Ricans to pursue independence. <laughs> As you can guess, officials forced Kent to paint over the letter, which is why it is a blank piece of paper. When we remember the art projects of the New Deal, we, we tend to recall those section murals that, deco that decorate local government buildings, primarily post offices. This is the art that most Americans came into contact with in the towns and cities across the country. Alabama had its share, and so I think we should talk about a few examples of it. Ann Wilson Goldthwaite was born in Montgomery and grew up in Dallas, Texas. An uncle, impressed by her talent, paid for her to study painting and etching at the National Academy of Design. She spent a summer at Princeton and met future president Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of Princeton at the time. She even painted a portrait of Wilson's then wife. Goldthwaite spent time in Paris, where she held a studio, but she returned to New York in time for the 1913 Armory Show. She suffered in the South, though, and won two section commissions, a mural for the Tuskegee Post Office, The Road to Tuskegee, from 1937, and here, The Letterbox, from 1938, for Atmore. Goldway exemplified what Bruce wanted in art. He wanted established artists whose work would reflect well on section. In the Atmore piece especially, Goldway shows us another characteristic of section murals, a glorification of the person paying for the mural, in this case, the mail service. In Baymanet, the Florida artist Hilton Leach painted a mural portraying the moving of the Baldwin County Courthouse from Daphne to Baymanet. In Pascagoula, Pennsylvania's Lauren Thompson, who would later illustrate Ranger Rick, a children's magazine, and you know it, painted Legend of the Singing River for the post office, depicting a folk tale in which a tribe of Pascagoula Indians drowned themselves in an attempt to save two lovers from the Biloxi tribe. One final section example. Some of the money Edward Bruce used to fund treasury work came from the Public Works of Art Project, the PWAP, the New Deal loved, just loved acronyms. <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize, there are tons of them. The PWAP was part of an earlier program, the Civil Works Administration, and in 1935, a regional director of the PWAP tapped Walter Inglis Anderson and his brother, James McConnell, to create murals for the Ocean Springs High School, public high school. The Andersons embraced the project. They saw it as an opportunity to show that Southern artists were just as talented as their highly lauded Northern counterparts. They also saw it as an opportunity to counter what they saw as superficial portrayals that artists made of the Southern environment. Matt painted and glazed a series of tiles in the entrance hall, the pelicans flounder and speckled trout running the length of the space. Walter painted murals on canvas, which he then glued to the walls of the auditorium. These are the largest paintings he ever made. Along one, along one wall, Biloxi Indians hunt, hunt deer, grow corn, and prepare food. On the other, modern-day Mississippians tong for oysters, race yachts, and live in coastal cottages. This work typifies section. It's simple, it's local, it's fully American. It gives a sense of place and inspires native pride. In the high-minded ideology of George Biddle, it creates, in the average Mississippian, an appreciation for culture. I love this quote by one Missouri postmaster who was talking about why he liked the art in his post office. He said, quote, how can a Finnish citizen be made in an artless town? <laughs> Bruce's goal for the various section projects was quality. Hence the very careful process by which first juries and then Bruce himself assessed artists given commissions. That selectivity resulted in beautiful work, but it also limited the actual amount of relief that was extended. In the depths of the Depression, section was stingy. It only gave money to artists who could prove they were talented artists. And so, because the New Deal's job was to put money into people's hands, 
It needed a broad program. And so in 1935, the WPA stepped in to center economic relief in art programs. Overall, WPA was led by administrator Harry Hopkins. His goal, in his own words, was to, quote, save the body and spirit of the American people by creating work and providing direct pay. And it was part of this creating work and providing pay that Hopkins formed Federal One, the Federal Theater Project, which put on plays across the country, the Federal Writers Project, which funded authors and poets and did oral history. You've probably heard of their oral history projects. The Federal Music Project, which funded symphonies and the preservation of folk music, and the Federal Art Project, the FAP, which we'll, we'll talk about. The man tasked with leading the FAP had, as we might say today, lived many lives by the time of his appointment. Born in Minnesota, Holger Cahill ran away to Canada at the age 13 to work as a farmhand. By 16, he made his way to Vancouver, where he boarded a steamship for Shanghai, working as a coal passer. He was only in China a very brief time when cholera hit, so he came back to the United States, or to North America. He worked as a cattle puncher, a railroad man, a crewman on a Great Lakes steamer, an insurance agent, and a short order cook. <laughs> After World War I, living in New York and writing, Cahill began studying art. And soon he had developed his own aesthetic philosophy, which he called Inge Inge. According to Cahill, the name derived from an obscure book which told of a South American tribe whose language consisted of only one word, Inge, which stood for everything. In such simplicity, Cahill saw a new future for art, one that abandoned what he called, quote, over-critification and excessively once, and saw beauty in simplicity. His movement was very short-lived, I'm not sure he had very many followers. But that spirit, that idea of simplicity as a way to express culture, formed his approach to the Federal Art Project. He found work as an art agent. He parlayed that into curator positions, first at the Newark Museum and then the Museum of Modern Art, where he focused on folk art and contemporary art. When offered the directorship of the FAP, he jumped at the chance. The Federal Art Project, from the beginning, was much bigger than Section. It was tied to this Make Work program, so its job was to put people to work. It had 14 times as much money as the Section of Fine Arts did, where Bruce's program produced about 16,000 pieces of art by about 3,800 artists. Cahill's resulted in 10,000 artists producing over 350,000 works. As one historian put it, the FAP produced, quote, an almost infinite variety of art. Lanning was an accomplished artist who had studied in Chicago and had exhibited at the Whitney. He first won a WPA commission to paint murals for the cafeteria at Ellis Island, designing a mural celebrating the work of Chinese and Irish immigrants on the railroads. That mural won Lanning a greater prize, the commission for a series of four panels to be featured in the main building of the New York Public Library called The Story of the Recorded Word. Lanning's painting panels celebrate printing. They begin with Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, and they culminate in contemporary printing processes. A fifth image, adorning the ceiling above the panels, shows Prometheus bringing the fire of Olympus to humanity. Here was the New Deal spirit, the triumph of man, the power of humanity, culminating in a very particularly American achievement, the modern free press. The FAP also resulted in probably the best-known local New Yorkers. Born in 1901, John Augustus Walker first embraced his artistic talents while in elementary school in the Mobile County school system. He worked a series of jobs, including as a stenographer in the freight department of the Mobile and Ohio Railroad. In his very limited free time, he studied drawing and painting with Mobile artist Edmund Cell. In the 1920s, Walker transferred to the MNO's St. Louis office and he began taking art classes at Washington University, where he adopted the very bright colors that would come to characterize his work. By the end of the decade, he was back in Mobile working as a full-time artist, painting beside Mardi Gras floats, teaching classes. Walker received several FAP commissions, but in 1935, he won the opportunity to paint a series of scenes for what was then Mobile City Hall, now the History Museum of Mobile. He produced 11 images capturing aspects of Mobile history, including discovery and building, 
which shows the construction of Fort Louis, the original site of Mobile, and we'll see that a little bit later. Science and Invention, which shows the construction of the Civil War era submarine, the Hunley. And then everyone's favorite, Fraternity, which shows Mobile's Mardi Gras traditions. Walker received $145 for his efforts. He went on to complete another series of murals for the WPA, 10 panels in cooperation with the Extension Service, which shows Alabama's agricultural past and present. That's, that series was featured at the Alabama State Fair, and we think about 30,000 people came to see them. In addition to the murals, the FAP included 17,700 pieces of sculpture, 108,000 paintings, and 11,300 original designs for 240,000 prints. <clears throat> Conchetta Scarabaglione was born in New York City, the child of Italian immigrants, and enrolled in the National Academy of Design at 16. A sculptor, she worked in a variety of media, including wood, metal, terracotta, and bronze. Under the FAP, she provided limestone sculptures for the Federal Trade Commission building, and a large plaster figure, Woman with Mountain Sheep, which graced the federal building for the 1939 World's Fair. For Scarabaglione and others, these commissions not only resulted in art for the public, they also ensured that during a time of severe poverty, when she may not have had a job, when she may not have been able to eat, when she may have had to take some other job just to keep food on the table, she could sculpt. She could hone her craft. She could develop her art. That was another success of the federal program. A number of very well-known painters worked with the FAP. Jackson Pollock, just before his shift to abstract painting, worked on WPA projects. And while a few of his, while very few of those works survive, the ones that do highlight labor and work. You can see here his cotton pickers. Mark Rothko, also free abstraction, painted studies of the NYC subway, which highlight the loneliness of urban life. Some of them were very striking. Google. Yet the majority of painters were amateurs and students who, in the FAP, benefited from a very unique ability to work in art. This was famously true for Willem de Kooning, who had jumped ship from the Netherlands in 1926 and made his way from Virginia to New Jersey and then to New York. He was a house painter, and then got a job working on murals for hotels. With the advent of the WPA, de Kooning was commissioned to design his own murals. He produced a number of studies, <coughs> None of them were realized. He suffered from the antipathy the WPA had for abstract art. But Jacuni seems to have been unfazed. For the first time, he was a professional artist. He was paid to, to create art. And it spurred him to consider himself an artist and to pursue art as a career. A better example, I think, and I think this is one of my favorites, is the way that the WPA, WPA provided opportunity. So let me tell you the story of Rob Godfrey. Godfrey was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He took drawing in junior college, and then in 1930 landed in art school in Chicago. He had a few paintings exhibited back home, but he thought that he would only be successful if he could make it to New York. And so he landed in New York in the midst of the Depression. He lived what we would call a hands to mouth existence. He found a place to live with some friends, but anytime they had visitors, he had to leave. And he often rode subways at night just to have a place to be at night. He was the perfect candidate for the WPA. He had some art training, and more importantly, he needed relief. So he took a position with the WPA, teaching art classes and on the side painting. At the, instance of his, at the insistence of his wife, he submitted one of his works, a portrait of her wearing a sport coat and a plaid scarf, to the National Academy of Design Show. It was accepted, it created some buzz, and then a few months later, the Metropolitan Museum of Art purchased it for their collection. I wanted to find a picture of it so bad, I just could not find a picture of it. But just know it happened. I did see the newspaper article that shows it happened, so I did see that. WPA artists also included printmakers who produced over 240,000 prints for schools, for government offices, and public services. WPA model builders produced dioramas for TVA dams, architectural models, theater scenes. WPA had a, quote, creative home planning division that was basically an interior design division. They built model rooms to help people choose colors and fabrics and lamps. One of the most ambitious of the WPA's practical art programs under, under, under the FAP 
was the Index of American Design. Over the life of the program, 300 people sought to document, document the history of design and folk art from the colonial period to the Gilded Age. Artists drew furniture, household items, clothes, ships' figureheads, weather vanes, toys, cigar store Indian figures, and baptismal fonts. The effort, Cahill promised, would, quote, recreate the past in human symbols for the average citizen. But it failed to capture the public's imagination. And it eventually ended up in a limited selection of colorized plates housed in the National Gallery. But it was ambitious. And it was work that people got paid to draw, to draw all these, these detailed um, illustrations of folk art and culture. Of the FAP efforts, perhaps none were more impactful than community art centers. The WPA funded over 100 centers in which locals might see artists at work, explore traveling art exhibits, or even take classes. Alabama had sites in Birmingham and Mobile, where the center was housed in the public library. The centers relied heavily on local funding and community participation. Citizens and bus business and civic organizations chipped in to provide space and materials, and people showed up. Local engagement fit perfectly with Cahill's artistic worldview. Modernization and industrialization had driven people to embrace novelty and mass production. But art centers, these would, in Cahill's words, return art to the people and share the experience of artistic culture. Naturally, these community art centers began with children, staffing classes in which school-aged kids learned artistic fundamentals. But as interest increased, class offerings expanded to include adults pursuing art as a hobby or as a future career. Even as WPA funding began to dry up in the 1940s, these art centers remained popular, and some of them even saw attendance increase. When war broke out, art centers taught classes on camouflage and organized groups of people making furniture and draperies for military bases. In many ways, art centers illustrated the democracy of the WPA an effort to bring art to everyone. Those art centers also illustrated some of the limits of American democracy in the 1940s, in that like all New Deal programs, they were strictly segregated by race. Black workers routinely made less than their white counterparts working the same relief jobs. Black farmers often found themselves left out of the benefits coming from New Deal farm programs. Programs relegated black participants to separate and unequal experiences, and the FAP was no different. Initially, the WPA employed very few black artists. Then, when a group in New York protested this fact, creating the Harlem Artists Guild to lobby the government for relief, Cahill increased opportunities for commissions. Charles, Charles Alston, who was a teacher at the Harlem Community Art Center and one of the leaders of the Artists Guild, won the commission for a series of murals at Harlem Hospital. His sketches, which focused on black contributions to American society, were initially rejected by white hospital supervisors, but an extensive lobbying campaign targeting President Roosevelt helped overcome resistance, and Alston's sketches prevailed. Hale Woodruff, an accomplished artist who had joined other black expatriates and traveled to Paris in the 1920s, returned to the U.S. in 1931. While living in Atlanta, Woodruff started working for the WPA, producing woodcuts. His woodcuts highlighted the poverty that African Americans faced in the South, but also showed their resilience in the face of hardship. Woodruff went on to connect the threads of the era. He traveled to Mexico and studied murals with Diego Rivera, and he came back to the South to paint a series of murals at Talladega College. The subject was the mutiny of Donnestad. I think it's hard not to see that and read into it a commentary on civil rights in the New Deal era. Art centers in the South tended to face more challenges in terms of funding and the quality of programs they offered. Even so, the segregated centers provided for black communities faced unique difficulties, except for rare instances in which a sympathetic state director or a particularly active local official pushed for support. Black centers tended to be underfunded. They tended to be relegated to poorly apportioned spaces. They often were ignored by predominantly white administrators, in some cases, northern black artists and instructors came to the South to staff the centers, only to find that it was almost impossible. 
Southern segregation was stifling, and many black communities who might have otherwise embraced it were afraid to be seen embracing outsider views that might turn white officials against them. But even so, those underfunded, segregated centers ministered to their communities. And instructors brought not only skills and a creative outlet, but a sense of pride in the production of art by black artists. The spirit of the FAP, that art is empowering, it's uplifting, it's for everyone, was a spirit that was undeterred by the color. By 1937, the WPA began experiencing the larger political pressures that faced the New Deal. That year, a recession led Roosevelt to cut funding to several programs in an attempt to rebalance the budget. Conservative critics targeted the theater program and the Writers' Project as hotbeds of communism. And while the art division escaped large-scale red bait, the entirety of Federal One suffered. Despite the wishes of its supporters, it was clear that the FAP would never become a permanent fixture of American life. And then Roosevelt, too, was distracted. Increasing tensions in Europe and Asia forced him to focus his attentions on the defense effort. Cahill, hoping to maintain control and funding for the FAP, pushed the government to utilize FAP artists for the war. And for a brief period, federal artists found work. We mentioned the art centers and kind of making things for the war effort. Um, but that was really only true for art centers that were close to military bases. Those farther away closed as funding increased. Artists who kept working made models of motors and engines for defense contractors. FAP printmakers designed patriotic posters and murals. But generally speaking, defense work required less individual creativity and increasingly less personal skill. Defense work was dictated, in which the poster maker, or muralist, or model builder was given a very specific task with very minimal room for creativity. And then after Pearl Harbor, critics of the art programs gained new ammunition. Money that went to a, an art center or to make a drawing of a cabinet would probably be better spent on an Allied victory. And so in 1943, the government shuttered the WPA, and with it, the programs of Federal One. By then, unemployment had largely been solved by defense factories dotting the American landscape. The crisis that had birthed an experimental program to put artists to work was over. But I think the federal art program bears the most to work. On the one hand, most historians would agree that it didn't succeed in its overarching vision. While the average American came into contact with WPA murals and paintings and prints at their post offices and schools, there's no evidence that such exposure brought a new art consciousness among people. We don't think Americans bought more art. We don't have evidence of that. We're not sure that Americans attended museums in notably greater numbers. And certainly, Americans didn't overwhelmingly support continued government efforts to provide funding for creative work. But if that's our measure for success, only numbers, only money, I think we're missing what the true, the true genius of the program. There were successes. The community art centers were a rousing success, bringing thousands of people to engage with working artists and building community spirit during hard times. For the individuals who won commissions or practiced their craft, the FAP allowed them to work, to make money, but also to continue working as artists, to hone skills and develop crafts that otherwise would have atrophied or been pushed aside because of need. For many young artists, the FAP was the very first opportunity they had to work as artists, to be professional artists. And more broadly, the arts programs of the New Deal, including those that encouraged music and theater and writing, they spurred a renewed appreciation of the life of the common person. This was a time when art was synonymous with Europe, with affluence, with wealth. But the muralists, the painters, the sculptors, the printmakers of the FAP, they portrayed everyday life. The workers who manned American factories, the farmers who plowed American fields, the people whose stories define communities across the country. When patrons visit the History Museum of Mobile, they crane their necks up to see John Augustus Walker's panels, they're connected to the human stories of Mobile. And I think that is the ultimate victory of the Federal Art Project. Thank you.